Working Cows Podcast, Episode 6. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. This episode has been brought to you in part by Kamac Ranch Supply. Check out their website at kamacranchsupply.com. This episode is also brought to you by chriswilliamsaudio.com. If you're a musician, podcaster, or filmmaker, don't settle for audio that's less than professional. Head on over to chriswilliamsaudio.com for all your podcasting, music production, and film audio needs. Our guest today on the Working Cows podcast is Aaron Berger. Aaron has served the Southern Panhandle of Nebraska as a beef systems educator since 2004. Aaron grew up on a seed stock operation and has worked in seed stock, cow-calf, yearling, and feedlot production segments. He received his bachelor's degree from University of Nebraska and his master's degree from Colorado State University. His passion is to provide clients resources and experiences that will help them meet their personal and business goals related to forage and cattle management. Aaron, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on. I appreciate the opportunity, Clay. I think one of the things that really opened my eyes in the opportunity that I had to sit in on uh, the High Plains Ranch practicum, which of which you are an instructor, uh, was kind of where the costs come from. What are some of the top costs that we find ourselves experiencing in order to successfully manage the ranch? How? What are those costs that we're looking at uh, dealing with? Well, as we think about specifically cow-calf enterprise, the real top three for my mind when I look at different operations, uh, number one is feed, and that's probably pretty obvious. And I, when I say feed, we're going to value graze feed at market value. So even if the ranch is owned, we're going to say we're going to ask the cows, on paper anyway, to pay fair market value for the grass that they graze. Second big cost would be labor and equipment, and that usually is number two. Uh, really, when we just think about it, that's sometimes those that's referred to as overhead cost, labor and equipment. And that's usually falls in the second slot, although sometimes it can be a number three. And then the third biggest cost usually is cow depreciation, and that's one that we don't write a check for. You don't get a bill in the mail that says cow depreciation. Uh, you don't have that really on your radar screen a lot of times. But when we look in the look at the cost of getting a bred female into the herd, either raising her ourselves and, and valuing her at market value at weaning and all development cost, or going out and purchasing a young bred female, and then comparing that to salvage value and looking at cow herd turnover, uh, that number frequently is second or third in terms of category, in terms of cost to the cow-calf enterprise. So what are the... Uh... I guess you've kind of touched on how you determine it. How do we determine cow depreciation? So cow depreciation is really a pretty straightforward formula. It works just like depreciation on a piece of equipment or, uh, you know, something else you would buy and then have some expected life. Uh, We're looking at the purchase price or development cost of that bred female to get her into the herd. We would subtract the cows. I'm going to use the term salvage value, or we could say exit value when she leaves the herd. Most of the time we think about coal cows, uh, we would use the term salvage value, and salvage value is a term we would use uh, if we were trading in equipment, and then dividing that by the number of years she's productive. And so, again, just like we depreciate a pickup or a tractor, uh, we're really depreciating this cow. So let's say we bought a bred heifer in this fall for $1,800, and we're going to assume she has uh, maybe a five-year productive life, and we're going to cull that cow out and have a value of $800. So her purchase price minus her salvage value is $1,000 divided by five years of productivity would give us, you know, cow depreciation of $200 per year. The challenge is that also cows, sometimes we don't get a salvage value for them, right? They die. 
<laughs> and that's where they're fully depreciated. So if we put an average cow value, say, of $1,300 on cows in the herd and figure a, you know, 2% on that, uh, we're going to add another 26 bucks a year in death loss. So uh, that's a cow that's fully depreciated. When she doesn't ever leave the ranch, she dies there. That's an expensive one. So I think, you know, if we're looking at 200 bucks or more on five years, that's a pretty significant amount. I think the challenging thing is people say, well, my cows last longer than five years, and maybe they do. But if you look on average, uh, most cow herds, cows are somewhere in that five to six year old age range on average. And we've got a lot more cows uh, six and under oftentimes than we do older than that. And so productive years somewhere in that three to five is pretty typical for the industry. Some folks do a little better than that. But if we're talking a 10 to 20 percent replacement rate, it's probably four and a half to five and a half years catches a lot of places in terms of what they're looking at, in terms of average productive life. One of the things that I like to do here on the Working Cows podcast is make sure that in the show notes page, people have resources that they can go and find, uh, different tools that they can use to help them more successfully manage the whatever practice it is we're talking about on that episode of the Working Cows podcast. So are there any tools out there uh, that people can use to keep track of that you know, uh, length of time spent in the herd? Uh, are there are there some pre-developed spreadsheets or something that we could turn people on to? So we, part of the ranch practicum class is we do have a unit cost production Excel-based spreadsheet that we work through. And part of that spreadsheet is that we have a cow replacement section where we look at a value of cows leaving the herd and then the cost of getting cows into the herd and have that as a part of the turnover where we can get a number per cow per year that can give us an indicator of where we're at from a cow depreciation standpoint. At the Beef website also, there's a recent article that talks about cow depreciation and some ways to address that. And I would reference people to that resource as well. You know, really, I think a good rule of thumb for me is to look at just simply, if I've got a static cow herd, what's the cost of getting a bred female into the herd? And then divide that or subtract off what the salvage value is of cows leaving the herd this year. If our cow herd inventory is pretty static, uh, we should have a total dollar value. So let's say I brought 20 cows into the herd at $1,800. You know, we're looking at $36,000 cost in. If I had, say, uh, you know, maybe I've got 18 cows leaving the herd this year at uh, $800 per cow. You know, I just simply take my 18 cows times 800. I'll do the math here real quick. I can't do that in my head. So 14,400. So I'm going to take my salvage value, credit that against the cost of bringing those females in, and then divide that by the number of cows I have in the herd. And that would give me a cow depreciation cost per cow uh, for this particular year. You know, obviously, if you're changing inventory, a lot of in, you got to make some inventory adjustment there. If you're building cow numbers or maybe you're not replacing cows, that can skew that figure. But that can really give you a kind of indicator of where you're at from a cow depreciation standpoint on a per cow basis. Sure. Are there any other management tools as far as tracking the actual individual cows in your herd and how long they've been part of your herd? Or is that a do you think that's a useful strategy? So I think we have to be careful, I guess, a little bit around automatically assuming that having cows longer reduces cow depreciation. So it does in effect. I mean, obviously, that's the denominator part, right? That's how many years do we get production out of a cow. We also have to understand when a cow depreciates, uh, we have some factors that go into that just beyond if she's how long she's there. So from Nebraska standpoint, typically we see cows appreciate and depreciate in value. And I'm not just talking about here market fluctuation in terms of the cattle cycle or things like that. But if we were to go to a major auction barn and look at some reputation two-year-olds, uh, they're going to bring some kind of value. I'll, I'll pick a number here. Maybe that's $1,600. If we, there was also bred females on the same sale that day calving at a similar time, if there were three and four-year-olds in Nebraska anyway, for similar quality, they'd actually bring more per head than those bred two-year-olds would. And that makes sense because a three- and four-year-old is going to tend to be more productive and also just easier to manage than that two-year-old. 
As we move to five to six-year-olds, that value would tend to decrease from what it would be as a three and four-year-old. And then once we move past six and start to get into that seven, eight, once we start to see dental deterioration in a cow, we start to see cow depreciation start to really increase. Uh, if we're getting out to that nine or 10 and we move from a, a you know a short, solid cow into what they call a, a broken mouth cow, then we really start to see values de- decrease pretty rapidly. So I think as we think about addressing cow depreciation, you want to think about what your resource base are, what you're good at. You know, if you're really good at developing replacement heifers, if your rebreed rate on those uh, second calf heifers and those cows coming with their uh, second calf, a three-year-old, if you're good at getting those back in the herd and can do that pretty cost effectively, maybe an opportunity to reduce cow depreciation is to turn your cow numbers faster. So once a cow gets to be age five or six, maybe we think about selling her uh, at her prime of life when she has the greatest value really and before we start to really start to see much cat appreciation. Sure. You know, on the other side of that, I guess what I would say, Clay, is that some folks might be looking at uh, buying in cows that are towards the end of their productive life. If they're in a scenario where they've got abundant feed, quality feed, uh, like Eastern Nebraska, if you've got corn stalks and ethanol co-products that are readily available, uh, you might be able to take an eight or nine-year-old cow and get another three or four years out of her have her still be very productive for you in your environment, but she doesn't fit an extensive range environment. So I think you really got to take a holistic approach to this. You got to take a systems approach. There's not a, just a automatic, here's your formula for how to make this work, depending on your resources. Sure. And as we've recorded episodes of the Working Cows podcast over and over again, it has been a continual theme that adaptability is an important part of running a successful ranching operation. Uh, first of all, you've got to adapt to your environment. Second of all, you've got to adapt to uh, marking conditions in the year-to-year changes. You've got to adapt to weather conditions. And so it's it's constantly changing. And, and that's part of what makes it so enjoyable is that it's new and different every day. The challenges are going to change from year-to-year and day-to-day and climate-to-climate and region to region as to how you can most successfully manage cow depreciation. Uh, I think that's exactly right. I think also you got to think about your cow numbers, I guess I would say. You know, I would throw out a number here and I'm sure folks would challenge this, but, you know, I think if you you need to look at your cow base and say, can I really afford the management and resources to develop my own replacement heifers? And, you know, I think there's situations, and I understand, especially in challenging environments where people have had negative experiences buying in bred females that weren't raised there. And I've I've had that same personal experience myself, especially in what I would call challenging environments. I also think that if you've got less than 200 cows, you need to really evaluate, can I afford to really have a replacement heifer development enterprise? Now, maybe you can make that work and it fits well uh, with your entire system, but In some cases, I think there's value to looking at maybe buying something in that you could use a terminal bull with, uh, basically simplify your operation and just go on and maybe look at buying in replacements rather than raising your own. Another thing I think that needs to be maybe talked about a little bit is just understanding, as you mentioned, how much change there can occur uh, in terms of market conditions. And we've seen a lot of change in the last three years. You know, looking at three dollar calves in 2014, dollar thirty calves in the fall of 2016, and now you know back up in that high dollar eighty, almost two bucks now on some of these calves this fall. A, a lot of variation. So one strategy I've seen some people try to use is think about dollar cost averaging as they think about the replacement. So they put in set aside a certain amount of money that they plan to spend each year, uh, maybe on bread replacements, and then you know in years like 2006 or 2014, when they were so high, they buy less. And then a year like last year, when they were uh, less expensive, they buy more. You know, I think the challenge with that a little bit too, is just realizing that if you've got a standard resource base, uh, being fully stocked is part of trying to get towards profitability. So uh, being down on numbers may not fit that very well. But I think having some flexibility in your cow numbers, if you can, uh, can help you manage this cow depreciation issue. Obviously, Hindsight's always twenty twenty, but for a lot of folks, one of the best economic decisions in terms of capturing cow value would have been to liquidate a lot of cows in 2014, and then you could have retained heifers or built back 
in lower priced years going forward. Understanding where the cattle market's been, understanding where you think it might be going can be another tool to manage this cat appreciation. Sure. You know, and, and uh, unfortunately, most uh, producers were looking at ways to sell more calves in 2014. And, uh, and uh, of course, we like to be positive and think that obviously 2014's numbers are going to hold. So when I increase my cow herd, I'm going to have more calves to sell at the same price next year. But uh, we all, like you said, hindsight's 2020, and we know that that not, is not necessarily the case. So those are things that we've got to take a look at. Aaron, I appreciate you joining me today. We're going to take a real quick break and thank our sponsors. We're talking with Aaron Berger of University of Nebraska Extension. We'll be right back. This episode has been brought to you in part by Kamac Ranch Supply. Check out their website at kamacranchsupply.com. They understand the needs of ranchers and farmers, whether you need to take care of your livestock, horses, or even building supplies. They have everything you need to work your cows, whether that be the chute you work them through, the water you bring them to, or the tools you use to make them go up that chute a little bit faster. So check out their website at kamacranchsupply.com. We're back here with Aaron Berger talking cow depreciation today and some different management strategies. Uh, One thing that we were talking about right before we went into that quick break, uh, you were talking about dollar value average. Um, And so on a year where heifers might be more expensive, you just buy less than less of them rather than saying, I have a certain number of heifers I need to put back into my herd and I'm going to buy that many heifers no matter how much it costs. Is that kind of a good understanding of what you're saying? Yeah, that's really is. Let's say, oh, let's say I on average need to replace 20 bred females a year. And let's say over the long term, I think those are going to cost me $1,500 on average. Maybe I commit $30,000 a year to spend on replacements. Well, if that's the case in a year like 2014, I may only bought 10 or 12 bred heifers. However, that same 30,000 might have bought me, you know, 25 in the fall of 2016. So that's that's a little bit challenging in that, you know, again, you're you're adjusting cow numbers a little bit on the input side, um, depending on how cows leave the herd, that can be challenging as well. But I do think it, it just illustrates, you know, a little bit uh, thinking about, again, how do we strategically manage this cat appreciation? It sounds like that strategy is uh, a tool to keep you from being put behind the eight ball of the market conditions. Like you're not at the mercy of the market anymore because you've got the the money budgeted and some years are going to buy more, some years you're going to buy less. But as we play the averages, because that's what we're dealing with when we're talking about cow depreciation, is that on the average, we're talking about three to five years of the life of a cow in the herd. We're playing the averages on the other side. On the average, I bet we're going to replace uh, over a five-year period, maybe we're going to replace the same amount as we look at a dollar average value strategy. Would that be something that we could... I, I think that... I think. Yeah, I think that would be accurate. I think also typically and we often when we buy in those or we retain those lower valued heifers in a typical cattle cycle, often those are in production then when prices rise. And and so it's it's uh, also sometimes they're culled out of the herd then when cold cow prices are high. It is again, it's nobody knows the future. Uh, the the markets are difficult to predict, but there tends to be trends. And right now, cow numbers are building. And so we'll see production tend to ramp up. I think uh, we're looking at almost 33 million beef cows in the United States right now. And I think this fall, the decent market prices we've seen are going to continue to encourage people to at least maintain or in some situations grow their cow numbers if they've got the feed resources to do that. So I think, you know, I would see that we're probably going to see some uh, numbers that would push some more calves to the market coming in 2018, 19. And so that could start to have a negative effect on cattle prices and uh, the cycle continues. Sure. I think one of the things you said in the class was that only God and a fool know the future. Is that right? That's exactly right. And I don't know who coined that phrase. It's not original with me, but uh, nobody knows what's really going to happen. If they did, they wouldn't need to even own cattle. They could just go trade the futures market. Sure. Yeah. I've been a preacher for 10 years. And uh, one of the things that I heard somebody say is the first time you quote somebody in public, you say, this person said. The next time you 
quote them in public, you say, you've heard it said. And then the third time you quote them in public, you say, I've always said. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know who original with that quote. I, I, uh, didn't do my homework to see who it was, but, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. So, um, one of the interesting things to me as we have examined this cow depreciation deal is that it's it's almost a perfect bell curve scale. We talk about the appreciation of the cow on the fir- in the first few years of life, kind of peaking around year three or four. Is that about right? Yeah, I would say, you know, that's pretty accurate. Uh, and then they start to trend off. I would see, say the, the tail gets a lot more sharp once you move past a six-year-old. Um, it tends to fall down more rapidly i guess what i'm saying is the the increase isn't as rapid as the decrease is from a two to a four-year-old in terms of if we're looking from a four out to a 10-year-old sure and so there are kind of two competing strategies that go along with that from my understanding and that is to sell cows at the at the peak of their appreciation or to bring in cows uh, who are on the backside of their depreciation. I think the what was said in class was that some people's philosophy is that a good cow has one good eye, two good tits, and three good legs. And then the other side of that is to sell a four-year-old or a five-year-old. Are there some places that we could go to learn about these kind of strategies as far as resources that we could maybe plug ourselves into to learn about these different strategies or the kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum? Yeah, that's a great question. So honestly, I don't know of many good resources on this. This is kind of out of the box for a lot of folks. We typically think about trying to keep cows in the herd a long time. Um, So it's a little bit of a different strategy. You know, I do think for a lot of cow calf producers though, there is some real emphasis, you know, trying to identify heifers early on that fit the resources. So having a short breeding season, uh, challenging those heifers in the development. So hopefully they fit your resources. And then also thinking about ways to capture value when cows leave the herd. And historically, traditionally, a lot of folks preg check cows in the fall, at least in this part of the world. And then uh, those open cows go to market when typically the market's lowest. Obviously, there's people that cavil all times of the year. And so I'm an advocate, depending on when you calve, of thinking about having a long breeding season with a short calving season where leave bulls out for a longer period of time. Again, you got to look at your cow numbers here and make sure you have enough to justify this. But then thinking about, can I sell a bred female to someone else that calves in their time window, but she doesn't fit mine? And the difference between a bred cow today and a cold cow, especially on a young running age cow, is probably four to 500 bucks fairly easily. And so if I'm like a February, March calver, there's a lot of people who calve in April, May, or if you're in March, April, there's people who calve May, June. And so thinking about, could you capture more values from cows that leave the herd for you uh, by leaving the herd as breads rather than as non-pregnant or open cows? Sure. And I don't, I don't know about average cow herd size in, in the United States, but I do know that in just the my anecdotal evidence of the people that I know, a lot of them are going to struggle to put together a package of uh, cows that are either bred or open that could be sold at a different time of the year, uh, as far as like a full uh, a full load of them. And so one of the things that was suggested in a discussion in the class, and I can't ha- recommend highly enough getting yourself involved in some kind of a continuing education program if you are in the ranching industry, and uh, whether that's a High Plains Ranch practicum or something else, getting yourself involved and being there for the discussions, because this might end up being one of the most valuable things to come out of that class was the suggestion of partnering with neighbors to put together a package of marketable females, be they bred or open, at a different time of the year. Because we all know that people don't want to haul them a pickup load at a time necessarily. They, they would like to get a, a semi-load if they could at least. Yeah, I think, you know, if you have some females and you can identify some neighbors or friends who've got similar type females that you could put together a package of, say, 30 or 40 breads versus having, you know, maybe five to 10, that sure increases the marketability of those and really probably adds significant value to being able to have a uniform group put together, especially if you're got similar breeding, similar genetics, uh, that, that certainly is an angle that could add some value. 
Aaron, I very much appreciate your time today. I do have just one more quick question uh, about the competition between a short breeding season for your heifers and a long breeding season for your cows. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Be happy to. You mentioned kind of both sides of that coin. Yeah, that on the surface almost sounds contradictory. So if we think about a yearly heifer, if she doesn't get bred, if she's not pregnant, she still has a lot of value in the marketplace as a feeder. We can roll her right into that program and she goes on and and uh, capture value there. On the other hand, if we come with a three-year-old that's open, she now moves into what we call a cold cow market, and she has less value in the marketplace, significantly less value than if she was not pregnant. And so what we're really wanting to do is uh, try to identify the best use for those animals at the point in time. We also, if we spent the money to get that heifer bred, got her into the herd, I spent quite a bit of money on her as a two-year-old. If she falls out as a three, that was an expensive deal. If she falls out as a yearling, to be honest, a good replacement heifer development program might be not much more than a glorified stalker yearling development system. And so that's really where I'm contrasting those. Also, if we can challenge those heifers early on, maybe we can identify those that are going to be the best cows for us. Once we get them bred, we really want to spend the resources we need to to have them in good condition when they calve as twos, provide adequate nutrition to get them rebred as threes because we spent the money. If we can get them to a four, they're going to probably tend to be productive for us and stay in the herd. So that's kind of the strategy I was outlining there. Yeah, they've at that point, when, they, when we get them to a four, they've already proven that they work in our system. And that is a big part of it, as we talked about earlier, the adaptability and, and some of those things. And so I thank you, Aaron, for coming on today. You have uh, shared some paradigm challenging practices for sure. We have gotten people maybe thinking a little bit outside of their box. And I, I just hope that it's something that we can use to spark a discussion about how we can manage what actually ends up being in a lot of cases, the second or third biggest cost in a ranching uh, operation. Thanks for the opportunity, Clay. This episode has been brought to you in part by chriswilliamsaudio.com. If you're a musician, podcaster, or filmmaker, making your product sound great is crucial. Don't settle for audio that's less than professional. No matter what type of audio service you need, Chris Williams and his team have got you covered. Head on over to chriswilliamsaudio.com for all your audio production needs. Well, I'm really excited about that episode. That was a a fun talk with Aaron, a fun time to uh, examine some of the hidden costs of a cow-calf operation that maybe we don't always think about and maybe some really practical tips on what we can do to help uh, mitigate those risks and those costs. So I hope that you found that very helpful. Links to all the resources that Aaron mentioned today will be up at workingcows.net slash six. So check out the show notes page at workingcows.net slash six for more information. Next week on the Working Cows podcast, we're going to talk with Josh Sebisma of Platt, South Dakota, about what they're doing there in a hoop beef system. Some of the resources that they have surrounding them limit where they can run cows because most people are there turning the soil and turning it into cropland and they don't want to run cows in on there. What they can do there with crops is more profitable than what they can do there with cows. And so they have had to find a way that they can run cows in a smaller space uh, for a longer period of time without harming the soil. And so we're going to talk to uh, Josh Sebesma about some of the things that they have done to solve the problems that they found Uh, as a limiting factor in their region. So join us next week for episode seven of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.